Chapter 87 The Challenge Then, continued Beauchamp, I took advantage of the silence and the darkness to leave the house without being seen. The usher who had introduced me was waiting for me at the door, and he conducted me through the corridors to a private entrance opening into the Rue de Vigarde. I left with mingled feelings of sorrow and delight. Excuse me, Albert, sorrow on your account, and delight with that noble girl thus pursuing paternal vengeance. Yes, Albert, from whatever source the blow may have proceeded, it may be from an enemy, but that enemy is only the agent of providence. Albert held his head between his hands. He raised his face, red with shame and bathed in tears, and seizing Beauchamp's arm, My friend, said he, my life is ended. I cannot calmly say with you, Providence has struck the blow. But I must discover who pursues me with this hatred, and when I have found him I shall kill him, or he will kill me. I rely on your friendship to assist me, Beauchamp, if contempt has not banished it from your heart. Contempt, my friend, how does this misfortune affect you? Know happily that unjust prejudice is forgotten, which made the son responsible for the father's actions. Review your life, Albert. Although it is only just beginning, did a lovely summer's day ever dawn with greater purity than has marked the commencement of your career? No, Albert, take my advice. You are young and rich. Leave Paris. All is soon forgotten in this great Babylon of excitement and changing tastes. You will return after three or four years with a Russian princess for a bride, and no one will think more of what occurred yesterday than if it had happened sixteen years ago. Thank you, my dear Beauchamp, thank you for the excellent feeling which prompts your advice, but it cannot be. I have told you my wish, or rather my determination. You understand that, interested as I am in this affair, I cannot see it in the same light as you do. What appears to you to emanate from a celestial source seems to me to proceed from one far less pure. Providence appears to me to have no share in this affair, and happily so, for instead of the invisible, impalpable agent of celestial rewards and punishments, I shall find one both palpable and visible, on whom I shall revenge myself, I assure you, for all I have suffered during the last month. Now I repeat, Beauchamp, I wish to return to human and material existence, and if you are still the friend you profess to be, help me to discover that hand that struck the blow. Be it so, said Beauchamp, if you must have me descend to earth, I submit, and if you will seek your enemy, I will assist you, and I will engage to find him, my honor being almost as deeply interested as yours. Well, then, you understand, Beauchamp, that we begin our search immediately. Every moment's delay is an eternity for me. The calumniator is not yet punished, and he may hope that he will not be, but on my honor, if he thinks it so, he deceives himself. Well, listen, Moserf. Ah, Beauchamp, I see you know something already. You will restore me to life. I do not say there is any truth in what I am going to tell you, but it is at least a ray of light in a dark night. By following it we may, perhaps, discover something more certain. Tell me, satisfy my impatience. Well, I will tell you what I did not like to mention on my return from Yanima. Say on. I went, of course, to the chief banker of the town to make inquiries. At the first word, before I had even mentioned your father's name, Ah, he said, I guess what brings you here. How and why? Because a fortnight since I was questioned on the same subject. By whom? By a Paris banker, my correspondent. Whose name is? Danglars. He, cried Albert, yes, indeed, it is he who has so long pursued my father with jealous hatred. He, the man who would be popular, cannot forgive the Count of Morcerf for being created a peer, and this marriage broken off without a reason being assigned. Yes, it is all from the same cause. Make inquiries, Albert, but do not be angry without reason. Make inquiries, and if it be true— Oh, yes, if it be true, cried the young man, he shall pay me all I have suffered. Beware, Morcerf, he is already an old man. I will respect his age as he has respected the honor of my family. If my father had offended him, why did he not attack him personally? Oh, no, he was afraid to encounter him face to face. I do not condemn you, Albert. I only restrain you. Act prudently. Oh, do not fear. Besides, you will accompany me. Beauchamp, 
solemn transactions should be sanctioned by a witness. Before this day closes, if M. Danglars is guilty, he shall cease to live, or I shall die. Pardieu, Beauchamp, mine shall be a splendid funeral. When such resolutions are made, Albert, they should be promptly executed. Do you wish to go to M. Danglars? Let us go immediately. They sent for a cabriolet. On entering the banker's mansion, they perceived the phaeton and servant of M. Andrea Cavalcante. Ah, perbleu, that's good, said Albert, with a gloomy tone. If M. Danglars will not fight with me, I will kill his son-in-law. Cavalcante will certainly fight. The servant announced the young man, but the banker, recollecting what had transpired the day before, did not wish him admitted. It was, however, too late. Albert had followed the footman, and, hearing the order given, forced the door open, and, followed by Beauchamp, found himself in the banker's study. "'Sir,' cried the latter, "'am I no longer at liberty to receive whom I choose in my house? You appear to forget yourself, sadly.' "'No, sir,' said Albert coldly. "'There are circumstances in which one cannot, except through cowardice. I offer you that refuge. Refuse to admit certain persons, at least.' "'What is your errand, then, with me, sir?' "'I mean,' said Albert, drawing near, and without apparently noticing Cavalcante, who stood with his back toward the fireplace, "'I mean to propose a meeting in some retired corner, where no one will interrupt us for ten minutes. That will be sufficient. Where two men, having met, one of them will remain on the ground.' Danglars turned pale, Cavalcante moved a step forward, and Albert turned towards him. "'And you, too,' he said, "'come, if you like, monsieur. "'You have a claim, being almost one of the family, "'and I will give as many rendezvous of that kind "'as I can find persons willing to accept them.' "'Cavalcante looked at Danglars with a stupefied air, "'and the latter, making an effort, "'arose and stepped between the two young men. "'Albert's attack on Andrea had placed him on a different footing, "'and he hoped this visit had another cause "'than that which he had first supposed.' "'Indeed, sir,' he said to Albert, "'if you are come to quarrel with this gentleman "'because I have preferred him to you, "'I shall resign the case to the king's attorney.' "'You mistake, sir,' said Marcerf, with a gloomy smile. "'I am not referring in the least to matrimony, "'and I only addressed myself to Monsieur Cavalcante "'because he appeared disposed to interfere between us. "'In one respect you are right, "'for I am ready to quarrel with every one to-day, "'but you have the first claim, Monsieur Danglars.' "'Sir,' replied Danglars, pale with anger and fear, "'I warn you, when I have the misfortune to meet with a mad dog, I kill it. "'And far from thinking myself guilty of a crime, I believe I do society a kindness. "'Now, if you are mad and try to bite me, I will kill you without pity. "'Is it my fault that your father has dishonoured himself?' "'Yes, miserable wretch,' cried Morcerf, "'it is your fault.' "'Danglars retreated a few steps. "'My fault,' he said, "'you must be mad. "'What do I know of the Grecian affair?' "'Have I travelled in that country? "'Did I advise your father to sell the castle of Yanina, to betray?' "'Silence!' said Albert, with a thundering voice. "'No, it is not you who have directly made this exposure, "'and brought this sorrow on us, "'but you hypocritically provoked it. "'I? "'Yes, you. How came it known? "'I suppose you read it in the paper, "'in the account from Yanina. "'Who wrote to Yanina? "'To Yanina? "'Yes. Who wrote for particulars concerning my father?' I imagine any one may write to Yanina, but one person only wrote. One only? Yes, and that was you. I doubtless wrote. It appears to me that when about to marry your daughter to a young man, it is right to make some inquiries respecting his family. It is not only a right, but a duty. You wrote, sir, knowing what answer you would receive. I indeed, I assure you, cried Danglars, with a confidence and security proceeding less from fear than from the interest he really felt for the young man. I solemnly declare to you that I should never have thought of writing to Yanina did I know anything of Ali Pasha's misfortunes. Who, then, urged you to write? Tell me. Pardieu, it was the most simple thing in the world. I was speaking of your father's past history. I said the origin of his fortune remained obscure. The person to whom I addressed my scruples asked me where your father had acquired his property. I answered, in Greece. Then he said, Write to Yanina. And who thus advised you? No other than your friend, Monte Cristo. The Count of Monte Cristo told you to write to Yanina? Yes, and I wrote, and will show you my correspondence if you like. Albert and Beauchamp looked at each other. Sir, said Beauchamp, who has not yet spoken, 
You appear to accuse the Count, who is absent from Paris at this moment, and cannot justify himself. I accuse no one, sir, said Danglars. I relate, and I will repeat before the Count what I have said to you. Does the Count know what answer you received? Yes, I showed it to him. Did he know my father's Christian name was Fernand, and his family name Mondego? Yes, I had told him that long since, and I did only what any other would have done in my circumstances, and perhaps less. When the day after the arrival of this answer, your father came, by the advice of Monte Cristo, to ask my daughter's hand for you, I decidedly refused him, but without any explanation or exposure. In short, why should I have any more to do with the affair? How did the honor or disgrace of Monsieur de Morcerf affect me? It neither increased nor decreased my income. Albert felt the blood mounting to his brow. There was no doubt upon the subject. Danglars defended himself with the baseness, but at the same time with the assurance of a man who speaks the truth, at least in part, if not wholly, not for conscience' sake, but through fear. Besides. What was Mercef seeking? It was not whether Danglars or Monte Cristo was more or less guilty. It was a man who would answer for the offence, whether trifling or serious. It was a man who would fight, and it was evident Danglars would not fight. And in addition to this, everything forgotten or unperceived before presented itself now to his recollection. Monte Cristo knew everything, as he had bought the daughter of Ali Pasha, and knowing everything, he had advised Danglars to write to Yanina. The answer known, he had yielded to Albert's wish to be introduced to Heidi, and allowed the conversation to turn on the death of Ali, and had not opposed Heidi's recital, but having doubtless warned the young girl in the few Romaic words he spoke to her not to implicate Morcerf's father. Besides, had he not begged of Morcerf not to mention his father's name before Heidi? Lastly, he had taken Albert to Normandy, when he knew the final blow was near. There could be no doubt that all had been calculated and previously arranged. Monte Cristo then was in league with his father's enemies. Albert took Beauchamp aside and communicated these ideas to him. "You are right," said the latter. "Monsieur Danglars has only been a secondary agent in this sad affair, and it is of Monsieur de Monte Cristo that you must demand an explanation." Albert turned, "Sir," he said to Danglars, "understand that I do not take a final leave of you." I must ascertain if your insinuations are just, and I am going now to inquire of the Count of Monte Cristo. He bowed to the banker and went out with Beauchamp without appearing to notice Cavalcanti. Danglars accompanied him to the door, where he again assured Albert that no motive of personal hatred had influenced him against the Count of Morcerf. End of chapter eighty-seven. Chapter 88. The Insult At the banker's door, Beauchamp stopped Morcerf. Listen, said he, just now I told you it was of Monsieur de Monte Cristo you must demand an explanation. Yes, and we are going to his house. Reflect, Morcerf, one moment before you go. On what shall I reflect? On the importance of the step you are taking. Is it more serious than going to Monsieur Danglars? Yes, Monsieur Danglars is a money lover, and those who love money, you know, think too much of what they risk to be easily induced to fight a duel. The other is, on the contrary, to all appearance, a true nobleman. But do you not fear to find him a bully? I fear only one thing, namely, to find a man who will not fight. Do not be alarmed, said Beauchamp. He will meet you. My only fear is that he will be too strong for you. My friend, said Morcerf with a sweet smile, that is what I wish. The happiest thing that could occur to me would be to die in my father's stead. That would save us all. Your mother would die of grief. My poor mother, said Albert, passing his hand across his eyes. I know she would, but better so than die of shame. Are you quite decided, Albert? Yes, let us go. But do you think we shall find the Count at home? He intended returning some hours after me, and doubtless he is now at home. They ordered the driver to take them to number 30, Champs-Élysées. 
Beauchamp wished to go in alone, but Albert observed that as this was an unusual circumstance, he might be allowed to deviate from the usual etiquette in affairs of honor. The cause which the young man espoused was one so sacred that Beauchamp had only to comply with all his wishes. He yielded and contented himself with following Morcerf. Albert sprang from the porter's lodge to the steps. He was received by Baptistin. The Count had indeed just arrived, but he was in his bath and had forbidden that any one should be admitted. But after his bath, asked Morcerf. My master will go to dinner. And after dinner? He will sleep an hour. Then? Then he is going to the opera. Are you sure of it? asked Albert. Quite, sir. My master has ordered his horses at eight o'clock precisely. Very good, replied Albert. That is all I wish to know. Then, turning to Beauchamp, if you have anything to attend to, Beauchamp, do it directly. If you have any appointment for this evening, defer it till tomorrow. I can depend on you to accompany me to the opera. And if you can, bring Chateau Renaud with you. Beauchamp availed himself of Albert's permission, and left him, promising to call for him at a quarter before eight. On his return home, Albert expressed his wish to Franz de Bray and Morel to see them at the opera that evening. Then he went to see his mother, who, since the events of the day before, had refused to see anyone, and had kept her room. He found her in bed, overwhelmed with grief at this public humiliation. The sight of Albert produced the effect which might naturally be expected on Mercedes. She pressed her son's hand and sobbed aloud, but her tears relieved her. Albert stood one moment speechless by the side of his mother's bed. It was evident from his pale face and knit brows that his resolution to revenge himself was growing weaker. "'My dear mother,' said he, "'do you know if Monsieur de Morcerf has any enemy?' Mercedes started. She noticed that the young man did not say my father. "'My son,' she said, "'persons in the Count's situation have many secret enemies.' Those who are known are not the most dangerous. I know it, and appeal to your penetration. You are of so superior a mind, nothing escapes you. Why do you say so? Because, for instance, you noticed on the evening of the ball we gave that Monsieur de Monte Cristo would eat nothing in our house. Mercedes raised herself on her feverish arm. Monsieur de Monte Cristo, she exclaimed, and how is he connected with the question you asked me? You know, mother. Monsieur de Monte Cristo is almost an Oriental, and it is customary with the Orientals to secure full liberty for revenge by not eating or drinking in the houses of their enemies. Do you say Monsieur de Monte Cristo is our enemy? replied Mercedes, becoming paler than the sheet which covered her. Who told you so? Why, you are mad, Albert. Monsieur de Monte Cristo has only shown us kindness. Monsieur de Monte Cristo saved your life. You yourself presented him to us. Oh, I entreat you, my son, if you had entertained such an idea, dispel it, and my counsel to you, nay, my prayer, is to retain his friendship. Mother, replied the young man, you have especial reasons for telling me to conciliate that man. I, said Mercedes, blushing as rapidly as she had turned pale, and again becoming paler than ever. Yes, doubtless, and is it not that he may never do us any harm? Mercedes shuddered, and, fixing on her son a scrutinizing gaze, "'You speak strangely,' said she to Albert. "'And you appear to have some singular prejudices. "'What has the Count done? Three days since you were with him in Normandy. "'Only three days since we looked on him as our best friend.' An ironical smile passed over Albert's lips. Mercedes saw it, and, with the double instinct of woman and mother, guessed all. But as she was prudent and strong-minded, she concealed both her sorrows and her fears. Albert was silent. An instant after, the Countess resumed. You came to inquire after my health. I will candidly acknowledge that I am not well. You should install yourself here and cheer my solitude. I do not wish to be left alone. Mother, said the young man, you know how gladly I would obey your wish, but an urgent and important affair obliges me to leave you for the whole evening. Well, replied Mercedes, sighing, go, Albert, I will not make you a slave to your filial piety. Albert pretended he did not hear, bowed to his mother, and quitted her. Scarcely had he shut her door, when Mercedes called a confidential servant, and ordered him to follow Albert wherever he should go that evening, and to come tell her immediately what he observed. Then she rang for her lady's maid, and weak as she was, she dressed, in order to be ready for whatever might happen. The footman's mission was an easy one. Albert went to his room and dressed with unusual care. 
At ten minutes to eight Beauchamp arrived. He had seen Chateau Renaud, who had promised to be in the orchestra before the curtain was raised. Both got into Albert's coupe, and, as the young man had no reason to conceal where he was going, he called aloud, to the opera. In his impatience, he arrived before the beginning of the performance. Chateau Renaud was at his post. Appraised by Beauchamp of the circumstances, he required no explanation from Albert. The conduct of the son in seeking to avenge his father was so natural that Chateau Renaud did not seek to dissuade him, and was content with renewing his assurance of devotion. Debray was not yet come, but Albert knew that he seldom lost a scene at the opera. Albert wandered about the theater until the curtain was drawn up. He hoped to meet with Monsieur de Monte Cristo either in the lobby or in the stairs. The bell summoned him to his seat, and he entered the orchestra with Chateau Renaud and Beauchamp. But his eyes scarcely quitted the box between the columns, which remained obstinately closed during the whole of the first act. At last, as Albert was looking at his watch for about the hundredth time, at the beginning of the second act the door opened and Monte Cristo entered, dressed in black, and, leaning over the front of the box, looked around the pit. Morrel followed him, and looked also for his sister and brother-in-law. He soon discovered them in another box, and kissed his hand to them. The Count, in his survey of the pit, encountered a pale face and threatening eyes which evidently sought to gain his attention. He recognized Albert, but thought it better not to notice him, as he looked so angry and discomposed. Without communicating his thoughts to his companion, he sat down, drew out his opera glass, and looked another way. Although apparently not noticing Albert, he did not, however, lose sight of him, and when the curtain fell at the end of the second act, he saw him leave the orchestra with his two friends. Then his head was seen passing at the back of the boxes, and the Count knew that the approaching storm was intended to fall on him. He was at the moment conversing cheerfully with Morrel, but he was well prepared for what might happen. The door opened, and Monte Cristo, turning round, saw Albert, pale and trembling, followed by Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud. "'Well!' cried he, with that benevolent politeness which distinguished his salutation from the common civilities of the world. "'My cavalier has attained his object. "'Good evening, Monsieur de Morcerf. "'The countenance of this man, "'who possessed such extraordinary control over his feelings, "'expressed the most perfect cordiality. "'Morel only then recollected the letter he had received from the Viscount, "'in which, without assigning any reason, "'begged him to go to the opera, "'but he understood that something terrible was brooding. "'We are not come here, sir, "'to exchange hypocritical expressions of politeness,' or false professions of friendship, said Albert, but to demand an explanation. The young man's trembling voice was scarcely audible. An explanation at the opera, said the Count, with that calm tone and penetrating eye which characterized the man who knows his cause is good. Little acquainted as I am with the habits of Parisians, I should not have thought this the place for such a demand. St Still, if people will shut themselves up, said Albert, and cannot be seen because they are bathing, dining, or asleep, we must avail ourselves of the opportunity whenever they are to be seen. I am not difficult of access, sir, for yesterday, if my memory does not deceive me, you were at my house. Yesterday I was at your house, sir, said the young man, because then I knew not who you were. In pronouncing these words, Albert had raised his voice so as to be heard by those in the adjoining boxes and in the lobby. Thus the attention of many was attracted by this altercation. "'Where you come from, sir? You do not appear to be in the possession of your senses. Provided I understand your perfidy, sir, and succeed in making you understand that I will be revenged, I shall be reasonable enough,' said Albert furiously. "'I do not understand you, sir,' replied Monte Cristo. "'And if I did, your tone is too high.' I am at home here, and I alone have a right to raise my voice above another's. Leave the box, sir! Monte Cristo pointed towards the door with the most commanding dignity. Ah, I shall know how to make you leave your home, replied Albert, clasping in his convulsed grasp the glove, which Monte Cristo did not lose sight of. Well, well, said Monte Cristo quietly. I see you wish to quarrel with me. "'But I would give you one piece of advice, which you will do well to keep in mind. "'It is in poor taste to make a display of a challenge. "'Display is not becoming to everyone, Monsieur de Morcerf.' "'At his name, a murmur of astonishment passed around the group of spectators of this scene. "'They had talked of no one but Morcerf the whole day. 
Albert understood the illusion in a moment, and was about to throw his glove at the Count when Morel seized his hand, while Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud, fearing the scene would surpass the limits of a challenge, held him back. But Monte Cristo, without rising and leaning forward in his chair, merely stretched out his arm and taking the damp, crushed glove from the clinched hand of the young man. Sir, said he, in a solemn tone, I consider your glove thrown, and will return it to you wrapped around a bullet. Now leave me, or I will summon my servants to throw you out the door. Wild, almost unconscious, and with eyes inflamed, Albert stepped back and Morel closed the door. Monte Cristo took up his glass again, as if nothing had happened. His face was like marble, and his heart was like bronze. Morel whispered, What have you done to him? I? Nothing. At least personally, said Monte Cristo. But there must be some cause for this strange scene. The Count of Morcerf's adventure exasperates the young man. Have you anything to do with it? It was through Haiti that the chamber was informed of his father's treason. Indeed, said Morrow, I had been told, but would not credit it, that this Grecian slave I have seen you with here in this very box was the daughter of Ali Pasha. It is true, nevertheless. Then, said Morrow, I understand it all, and this scene was premeditated. How so? Yes. Albert wrote to request me to come to the opera, doubtless that I might be a witness to the insult he meant to offer you. Probably, said Monte Cristo with his imperturbable tranquillity. But what shall you do with him? With whom? With Albert. What shall I do with Albert? As certainly, Maximilian, as I now press your hand, I shall kill him before ten o'clock tomorrow morning. Morrel, in his turn, took Monte Cristo's hand in both of his, and he shuddered to feel how cold and steady it was. Ah, Count, said he, his father loves him so much. Do not speak to me of that said Monte Cristo, with the first movement of anger he had betrayed. I will make him suffer. Moral, amazed, let, Mont let fall Monte Cristo's hand. Count, Count, said he. Dear Maximilian, interrupted the Count, listen how adorably Dupre is singing that line. Oh, Matilde, idole de mon arme. I was the first to discover Dupre at Naples, and the first to applaud him. Bravo, bravo! Morrel saw it was useless to say more, and refrained. The curtain, which had risen at the close of the scene with Albert, again fell, and a rap was heard at the door. "'Come in,' said Monte Cristo, with a voice that betrayed not the least emotion, and immediately Beauchamp appeared. "'Good evening, Monsieur Beauchamp,' said Monte Cristo, as if this was the first time he had seen the journalist that evening. "'Be seated.' Beauchamp bowed, and sitting down, "'Sir,' said he, I just now accompanied Monsieur de Morcerf, as you saw. And that means, replied Monte Cristo, laughing, that you had probably just dined together. I am happy to see, Monsieur Beauchamp, that you are more sober than he was. Sir, said Monsieur Beauchamp, Albert was wrong, I acknowledge, to betray so much anger, and I come, on my own account, to apologize for him. And having done so entirely on my own account, be it understood, I would add that I believe you too gentlemanly to refuse him some explanation concerning your connection with Yanina. Then I will add two words about the young Greek girl. Monte Cristo motioned him to be silent. Come, said he, laughing. There are all my hopes about to be destroyed. How so? asked Beauchamp. Doubtless you wish to make me appear a very eccentric character. I am, in your opinion, a Lara, a Manfred, a Lord Ruthven. Then, just as I am arriving at the climax, you defeat your own end and seek to make an ordinary man of me. You bring me down to your own level and demand explanations. Indeed, Monsieur Beauchamp, it is quite laughable. Yet, replied Beauchamp haughtily, there are occasions when probity commands. Monsieur Beauchamp, interposed this strange man, the Count of Monte Cristo bows to none but the Count of Monte Cristo himself. Say no more, I entreat you. I do what I please, Monsieur Beauchamp. And it is always well done. Sir, replied the young man, honest men are not to be paid with such coin. I require honorable guarantees. I am, sir, a living guarantee, replied Monte Cristo, motionless but with a threatening look. We have both blood in our veins which we wish to shed. That is our mutual guarantee. Tell the Viscount so, so that tomorrow, before ten o'clock, I shall see what color his is. 
"'Then I have only to make arrangements for the duel,' said Beauchamp. "'It is quite immaterial to me,' said Monte Cristo. "'And it was very unnecessary to disturb me at the opera for such a trifle. "'In France people fight with the sword or pistol, "'in the colonies with the carbine, and in Arabia with the dagger. "'Tell your client that, although I am the insulted party, "'in order to carry out my eccentricity I leave him the choice of arms, "'and will accept without discussion, without dispute, anything, "'even combat by drawing lots, "'which is always stupid, but with me different from other people, "'as I am sure to gain.' "'Sure to gain,' repeated Beauchamp, looking with amazement at the Count. "'Certainly,' said Monte Cristo, slightly shrugging his shoulders. "'Otherwise I would not fight with Monsieur de Morcerf. I shall kill him. I cannot help it. Only by a single line this evening at my house let me know the arms and the hour. I do not like to be kept waiting.' "'Pistols, then, at eight o'clock in the Bois de Vincennes,' said Beauchamp, quite disconcerted, not knowing if he was dealing with an arrogant braggadocio or a supernatural being. "'Very well, sir,' said Monte Cristo. "'Now all that is settled. Do let me see the performance, and tell your friend Albert not to come any more this evening. He will hurt himself with all his ill-chosen barbarisms. Let him go home and go to sleep.' Beauchamp left the box, perfectly amazed. "'Now,' said Monte Cristo, turning to Moro, "'I may depend upon you, may I not?' Certainly, said Morrow. I am at your servant's count. Still, what? It is desirable I should know the real cause. That is to say, you would rather not? No. The young man himself is acting blindfolded, and knows not the true cause, which is known only to God and me. But I will give you my word, Morrow, that God, who does know it, will be on our side. Enough said Morrel. Who is your second witness? I know no one in Paris, Morrel, on whom I could confer that honor besides you and your brother Emmanuel. Do you think Emmanuel would oblige me? I will answer for him, Count. Well, that is all I require. Tomorrow morning, at seven o'clock, you will be with me, will you not? We will. Hush, the curtain is rising. Listen, I never lose a note of this opera if I can avoid it. The music of William Tell is so sweet. End of chapter 88
uttered a slight exclamation, and let fall the pistol he held. "'What name did you pronounce them, Madame de Morcerf?' said he. "'Yours,' cried she, throwing back her veil. "'Yours, which I alone, perhaps, have not forgotten. "'Edmund, it is not Madame de Morcerf who has come to you. "'It is Mercedes.' "'Mercedes is dead, madame,' said Monte Cristo. "'I know no one now of that name. "'Mercedes lives, sir, and she remembers, "'for she alone recognized you when she saw you, "'and even before she saw you, by your voice, Edmund, "'by the simple sound of your voice. "'And from that moment she has followed your steps, "'watched you, feared you, "'and she needs not to inquire.' What hand has dealt the blow which now strikes Monsieur de Morcerf? Ferdinand, you mean, replied Monte Cristo, with bitter irony, since we are recalling names, let us remember them all. Monte Cristo had pronounced the name of Ferdinand with such an expression of hatred that Mercedes felt a thrill of horror run through every vein. You see, Edmund, I am not mistaken, and have cause to say, Spare my son! And who told you, madame, that I have any hostile intentions against your son? No one, in truth, but a mother has twofold sight. I guessed all. I followed him this evening to the opera, and concealed in a parquet box, have seen all. If you have seen all, madame, you know that the son of Ferdinand has publicly insulted me, said Monte Cristo with awful calmness. Oh, for pity's sake! You have seen that he would have thrown his glove in my face if Morel, one of my friends, had not stopped him. Listen to me. My son has also guessed who you are. He attributes his father's misfortunes to you. Madame, you are mistaken, they are not misfortunes. It is a punishment. It is not I who strike Monsieur de Morcerf. It is Providence which punishes him. And why do you represent Providence? cried Mercedes. Why do you remember when it forgets? What are Yanina and its vizier to you, Edmund? What injury has Fernand Mondego done you in betraying Ali? Tepelini. Ah, madame, replied Monte Cristo, all this is an affair between the French captain and the daughter of Vasiliki. It does not concern me. You are right. And if I have sworn to revenge myself, it is not on the French captain or the Count of Montserf, but on the fisherman Fernand, the husband of Mercedes the Catalan. Ah, sir, cried the Countess, how terrible a vengeance for a fault which fatality made me commit, for I am the only culprit, Edmund, and if you owe revenge to any one, it is to me who had not fortitude to bear your absence and my solitude. But, exclaimed Monte Cristo, why was I absent, and why were you alone? Because you had been arrested, Edmund, and were a prisoner. And why was I arrested? Why was I a prisoner? I do not know, said Mercedes. You do not, madame, at least. I hope not. But I will tell you. I was arrested and became a prisoner because, upon the arbor of La Reserve, the day before I was to marry you, a man named Danglar wrote this letter, which the fisherman Fernand himself posted. Monte Cristo went to a secretary, opened a drawer by a spring, from which he took a paper which had lost its original color, and the ink of which had become of a rusty hue. This he placed in the hands of Mercedes. It was Danglars' letter to the king's attorney, which the Count of Monte Cristo, disguised as a clerk from the house of Thompson and French, had taken from the file against Edmund Dantes on the day he had paid the two hundred thousand francs to M. de Beauville. Mercedes read with terror the following lines. 
the king's attorney is informed by a friend to the throne and religion that one Edmund Dantes, second in command on the board of Farion, this day arrived from Smyrna, after having touched at Naples and Porto Ferrajo, is the bearer of a letter from Murat to the usurper, and of another letter from the usurper to the Bonapartist Club in Paris. Ample corroboration of this statement may be obtained by arresting the above-mentioned Edmund Dantes, who either carries the letter for Paris about with him, or has it at his father's abode, should it not be found in possession of either father or son, then it will assuredly be discovered in the cabin belonging to the said Dantes on board the Farion. How dreadful, said Mercedes, passing her hand across her brow, moist with perspiration, and that letter? I bought it for two hundred thousand francs, madame, said Monte Cristo, but that is a trifle, since it enables me to justify myself to you. And the result of that letter, you well know, madam, was my arrest. But you do not know how long that arrest lasted. You do not know that I remained for fourteen years, within a quarter of a league of you, in a dungeon, in the Chateau d'If. You do not know that every day of those fourteen years I renewed the vow of vengeance which I had made the first day, and yet I was not aware that you had married, Fernand, my calumniator, and that my father had died of hunger. Can it be? cried Mercedes, shuddering. That is what I heard on leaving my prison fourteen years after I had entered it, and that is why, on account of the living Mercedes and my deceased father, I have sworn to revenge myself on Fernand, and I have revenged myself. And are you sure the unhappy Fernand did that? I am satisfied, madame, that he did what I have told you. Besides, that is not much more odious than that a Frenchman by adoption should pass over to the English, that a Spaniard by birth should have fought against the Spaniards, that a stipendiary of Ali should have betrayed and murdered Ali. Compared with such things, what is the letter you have just read? A lover's deception, which the woman who has married the man ought certainly to forgive, but not so the lover who was to have married her. Well, the French did not avenge themselves on the traitor. The Spaniards did not shoot the traitor. Ali, in his tomb, left the traitor unpunished. But I, betrayed, sacrificed, buried, have risen from my tomb, by the grace of God, to punish that man. He sends me for that purpose, and here... I am. The poor woman's head and arms fell. Her legs bent under her, and she fell on her knees. Forgive, Edmund, forgive for my sake, who love you still. The dignity of the wife checked the fervor of the lover and the mother. Her forehead almost touched the carpet, when the Count sprang forward and raised her. Then, seated on a chair, she looked at the manly countenance of Monte Cristo, on which grief and hatred still impressed a threatening expression. Not crush that accursed race, murmured he, abandon my purpose at the moment of its accomplishment. Impossible, madam, impossible. Edmund, said the poor mother, who tried every means, when I call you Edmund, why do you not call me Mercedes? Mercedes, repeated Monte Cristo. Mercedes, why, well, yes, you are right. That name has still its charms, and this is the first time for a long period that I have pronounced it so distinctly. Oh, Mercedes, I have uttered your name with the sign of melancholy, with the groan of sorrow, with the last effort of despair. 
I have uttered it when frozen with cold, crouched on the straw in my dungeon. I have uttered it consumed with heat, rolling on the stone floor of my prison. Mercedes, I must revenge myself, for I have suffered fourteen years. Fourteen years I wept, I cursed. Now I tell you, Mercedes, I must revenge myself. The Count, fearing to yield to the entreaties of her he had so ardently loved, called his sufferings to the assistance of his hatred. "'Revenge yourself, then, Edmund,' cried the poor mother. "'But let your vengeance fall on the culprits, on him, on me, but not on my son.' It is written in the good book, said Monte Cristo, that the sins of the fathers shall fall upon their children to the third and fourth generation. Since God himself dictated those words to his prophet, why should I seek to make myself better than God? Edmund, continued Mercedes, with her arms extended towards the Count, since I first knew you, I have adored your name, have respected your memory. Edmund, my friend, do not compel me to tarnish that noble and pure image reflected incessantly on the mirror of my heart. Edmund, if you knew all the prayers I have addressed to God for you while I thought you were living, and since I have thought you must be dead, yes, dead, alas, I imagined your dead body buried at the foot of some gloomy tower, or cast to the bottom of a pit by hateful jailers, and I wept. What could I do for you, Edmund, besides pray and weep? Listen, for ten years I dreamed each night the same dream. I had been told that you had endeavored to escape, that you had taken the place of another prisoner, that you had slipped into the winding-sheet of a dead body, that you had been thrown alive from the top of the Chateau d'If, and that the cry you uttered as you dashed upon the rocks first revealed to your jailers that they were your murderers. Well, Edmund, I swear to you, by the head of that son for whom I entreat your pity, Edmund, for ten years I saw every night every detail of that frightful tragedy, and for ten years I heard every night the cry which awoke me, shuddering and cold. And I, too, Edmund, oh, believe me, guilty as I was, oh, yes, I, too, have suffered much. Have you known what it is to have your father starve to death in your absence? cried Monte Cristo thrusting his hands into his hair, have you seen the woman you loved giving her hand to your rival, while you were perishing at the bottom of a dungeon? No, interrupted Mercedes, but I have seen him who I loved on the point of murdering my son. Mercedes uttered these words with such deep anguish, with an accent of such intense despair, that Monte Cristo could not restrain a sob. The lion was daunted, the avenger was conquered. "'What do you ask of me?' said he. "'Your son's life? Well, he shall live.' Mercedes uttered a cry, which made the tears start from Monte Cristo's eyes. But these tears disappeared almost instantaneously, for, doubtless, God had sent some angel to collect them, Far more precious were they in his eyes than the richest pearls of Guzerat and Ophir. Oh, said she, seizing the Count's hand and raising it to her lips, oh, thank you, thank you, Edmund. Now you are exactly what I dreamt you were, the man I always loved. Oh, now I may say so. So much the better, replied Monte Cristo as that poor Edmund will not have long to be loved by you. Death is about to return to the tomb, the phantom, to retire in darkness. What do you say, Edmund? I say, 
since you command me, Mercedes, I must die. Die? And why so? Who talks of dying? Whence have you these ideas of death? You do not suppose that, publicly outraged in the face of a whole theatre, in the presence of your friends and those of your son, challenged by a boy who will glory in my forgiveness, as if it were a victory, you do not suppose that I can for one moment wish to live. What I most loved after you, Mercedes, was myself, my dignity, and that strength which rendered me superior to other men. That strength was my life. With one word, you have crushed it, and I die. But the duel will not take place, Edmund, since you forgive. It will take place, said Monte Cristo, in a most solemn tone. But instead of your son's blood to stain the ground, mine will flow. Mercedes shrieked, and sprang towards Monte Cristo, but suddenly stopping. Edmund, said she, there is a God above us, since you live and since I have seen you again. I trust to him from my heart. While waiting his assistance, I trust to your word. You have said that my son should live, have you not? Yes, madame, he shall live, said Monte Cristo, surprised that without more emotion Mercedes had accepted the heroic sacrifice he made for her. Mercedes extended her hand to the Count. Edmund, said she, and her eyes were wet with tears while looking at him to whom she spoke, how noble it is of you, how great the action you have performed, how sublime to have taken pity on a poor woman who appealed to you with every chance against her. Alas, I am grown old with grief, more than with years, and cannot now remind my Edmund by a smile, or by a look, of that Mercedes whom he once spent so many hours in contemplating. Ah, believe me, Edmund, as I told you, I too have suffered much. I repeat, it is melancholy to pass one's life without having one joy to recall, without preserving a single hope. But that proves that all is not yet over. No, it is not finished. I feel it by what remains in my heart. Oh, I repeat it, Edmund. What you have just done is beautiful. It is grand. It is sublime. Do you say so now, Mercedes? Then what would you say if you knew the extent of the sacrifice I made to you? Suppose that the Supreme Being, after having created the world and fertilized chaos, had paused in the work to spare an angel the tears that might flow one day for mortal sins from her immortal eyes. Suppose that when everything was in readiness, and the moment had come for God to look upon his work and see that it was good, suppose he had snuffed out the sun and tossed the world back into eternal night. Then, even then, Mercedes, you could not imagine what I lose in sacrificing my life at this moment. Mercedes looked at the Count in a way which expressed at the same time her astonishment, her admiration, and her gratitude. Monte Cristo pressed his forehead on his burning hands, as if his brain could no longer bear alone the weight of its thoughts. Edmund, said Mercedes, I have but one word more to say to you. The Count smiled bitterly. Edmund, continued she, you will see that if my face is pale, if my eyes are dull, if my beauty is gone, if Mercedes, in short, no longer resembles her former self in her features, you will see that her heart is still the same. Adieu, then, Edmund. I have nothing more to ask of heaven. I have seen you again, 
and have found you as noble and as great as formerly you were. But the Count did not answer. Mercedes opened the door of the study and had disappeared before he had recovered from the painful and profound reverie into which his thwarted vengeance had plunged him. The clock of the Invalide struck one when the carriage which conveyed Madame de Morcerf away rolled on the pavement of the Champs-Élysées, and made Monte Cristo raise his head. What a fool I was, said he, not to tear my heart out on the day when I resolved to avenge myself. End of chapter 89, read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox. Spring 2007Chapter 90. The Meeting. After Mercedes had left Monte Cristo, he fell into profound gloom. Around him, and within him, the flight of thought seemed to have stopped. His energetic mind slumbered, as the body does after extreme fatigue. What? said he to himself, while the lamp and the wax lights were nearly burnt out and the servants were waiting impatiently in the ante-room. What? This edifice which I have been so long preparing, which I have reared with so much care and toil, is to be crushed by a single touch, a word, a breath. Yes, this self, of whom I thought so much, of whom I was so proud, who had appeared so worthless in the dungeons of the Chateau d'If, and whom I had succeeded in making so great, will be but a lump of clay to-morrow. Alas, it is not the death of the body I regret, for is not the destruction of the vital principle, the repose to which everything is tending, to which every unhappy being aspires, is not this the repose of matter, after which I so long sighed, and which I was seeking to attain by the painful process of starvation, when Faria appeared in my dungeon. What is death for me? One step farther into rest, two, perhaps, into silence. No, it is not existence, then, that I regret, but the ruin of projects so slowly carried out, so laboriously framed. Providence is now opposed to them, when I most thought it would be propitious. It is not God's will that they should be accomplished. This burden, almost as heavy as a world, which I had raised, and I had thought to bear to the end, was too great for my strength, and I was compelled to lay it down in the middle of my career. Oh, shall I then again become a fatalist, whom fourteen years of despair and ten of hope had rendered a believer in providence. And all this, all this, because my heart, which I thought dead, was only sleeping, because it has awakened and has begun to beat again, because I have yielded to the pain of the emotion excited in my breast by a woman's voice. Yet, continued the Count, becoming each moment more absorbed in the anticipation of the dreadful sacrifice of the morrow, which Mercedes had accepted, yet it is impossible that so noble-minded a woman should thus, through selfishness, consent to my death when I am in the prime of life and strength. It is impossible that she can carry to such a point maternal love, or rather delirium. There are virtues which become crimes by exaggeration. No, 
She must have conceived some pathetic scene. She will come and throw herself between us, and what would be sublime here will there appear ridiculous. The blush of pride mounted to the Count's forehead, as this thought passed through his mind. Ridiculous, repeated he, and the ridicule will fall on me. I, ridiculous, no, I would rather die. By thus exaggerating to his own mind the anticipated ill fortune of the next day, to which he had condemned himself by promising Mercedes to spare her son, the Count at last exclaimed, Folly, 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 to carry generosity so far as to put myself up as a mark for that young man to aim at? He will never believe that my death was suicide. And yet it is important for the honour of my memory, and this surely is not vanity, but a justifiable pride. It is important the world should know that I have consented, by my free will, to stop my arm, already raised, to strike, and that, with the arm which has been so powerful against others, I have struck myself. It must be, it shall be. Seizing a pen, he drew a paper from a secret drawer in his desk, and wrote at the bottom of the document, which was no other than his will, made since his arrival in Paris, a sort of codicil, clearly explaining the nature of his death. I do this, O oh my God, said he, and his eyes raised to heaven as much for thy honour as for mine. I have during ten years considered myself the agent of thy vengeance, and other wretches, like Morcerf, Danglars, Villefort, even Monserf himself, must not imagine that chance has freed them from their enemy. Let them know, on the contrary, that their punishment, which has been decreed by Providence, is only delayed by my present determination, and although they escape it in this world, it awaits them in another, and that they are only exchanging time for eternity. While he was thus agitated by gloomy uncertainties, wretched waking dreams of grief, the first rays of morning pierced his windows, and shone upon the pale blue paper on which he had just inscribed his justification of providence. It was just five o'clock in the morning, when a slight noise, like a stifled sigh, reached his ear. He turned his head, looked around him, and saw no one, but the sound was repeated distinctly enough to convince him of its reality. He arose, and, quietly opening the door of the drawing-room, saw Haide, who had fallen on a chair, with her arms hanging down, and her beautiful head thrown back. She had been standing at the door, to prevent his going out without seeing her, until sleep, which the young cannot resist, had overpowered her frame, wearied as she was with watching. The noise of the door did not awaken her, and Monte Cristo gazed at her with affectionate regret. She remembered that she had a son, said he, and I forgot I had a daughter. Then, shaking his head sorrowfully, Poor I day, said he, she wished to see me, to speak to me, she has feared or guessed something. Oh, I cannot go without taking leave of her. I cannot die without confiding her to someone. He quietly regained his seat, and wrote under the other lines, I bequeath to Maximilian Morel, captain of Spahis, and son of my former patron, Pierre Morel, shipowner of Marseilles, the sum of twenty millions, 
a part of which may be offered to his sister Julia and brother-in-law Emmanuel, if he does not fear this increase of fortune may mar their happiness. These twenty millions are concealed in my grotto at Monte Cristo, of which Bertuccio knows the secret. If his heart is free, and he will marry Haide, the daughter of Ali Pasha of Yanina, whom I have brought up with the love of a father, and who has shown the love and tenderness of a daughter for me, he will thus accomplish my last wish. This will has already constituted Haide heiress of the rest of my fortune, consisting of lands, funds in England, Austria, and Holland, furniture in my different palaces and houses, and which without the twenty millions and the legacies to my servants may still amount to sixty millions. He was finishing the last line, when a cry behind him made him start, and the pen fell from his hand. Haide, said he, did you read it? Oh, my lord, said she, why are you writing thus at such an hour? Why are you bequeathing all your fortune to me? Are you going to leave me? I am going on a journey, dear child, said Monte Cristo, with an expression of infinite tenderness and melancholy, and if any misfortune should happen to me, the Count stopped. Well, asked the young girl, with an authoritative tone, the Count had never observed before, and which startled him. Well, if any misfortune happened to me, replied Monte Cristo, I wish my daughter to be happy. Haide smiled sorrowfully, and shook her head. Do you think of dying? my lord, said she. The wise man, my child, has said, It is good to think of death. Well, if you die, said she, bequeath your fortune to others, for if you die, I shall require nothing. And taking the paper, she tore it in four pieces, and threw it into the middle of the room. Then, the effort having exhausted her strength, she fell not asleep this time, but fainting on the floor. The Count leaned over her and raised her in his arms, and seeing that sweet, pale face, those lovely eyes closed, that beautiful form motionless, and to all appearance lifeless, the idea occurred to him for the first time that perhaps she loved him otherwise than as a daughter loves a father. Alas, murmured he with intense suffering, I might, then, have been happy yet. Then he carried Haide to her room, resigned her to the care of her attendants, and, returning to his study, which he shut quickly this time, he again copied the destroyed will. As he was finishing, the sound of a cabriolet entering the yard was heard. Monte Cristo approached the window, and saw Maximilian and Emmanuel alight. Good, said he, it was time, and he sealed his will with three seals. A moment afterwards he heard a noise in the drawing-room, and went to open the door himself. Morel was there. He had come twenty minutes before the time appointed. I am perhaps come too soon, Count, said he, but I frankly acknowledge that I have not closed my eyes all night, nor has any one in my house. I need to see you strong in your courageous assurance to recover myself. Monte Cristo could not resist this proof of affection. He not only extended his hand to the young man, but flew to him with open arms. Morel, said he, it is a happy day for me 
to feel that I am beloved by such a man as you. Good morning, Emmanuel. You will come with me then, Maximilian. Did you doubt it? said the young captain. But if I were wrong, I watched you during the whole scene of that challenge yesterday. I have been thinking of your firmness all night, and I said to myself that justice must be on your side, or man's countenance is no longer to be relied on. But Morel, Albert is your friend, simply an acquaintance, sir. You met on the same day you first saw me. Yes, that tis true, but I should not have recollected it if you had not reminded me. Thank you, Morel. Then ringing the bell once. Look, said he to Ali, who came immediately, take that to my solicitor. It is my will, Morel. When I am dead, you will go and examine it. What? said Morel. You? Dead? Yes. Must I not be prepared for everything, dear friend? But what did you do yesterday after you left me? I went to Tortoni's, where, as I expected, I found Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud. I own I was seeking them. Why, when all was arranged, listen, Count, the affair is serious and unavoidable. Did you doubt it? No, the offence was public, and every one is already talking of it. Well, well, I hope to get an exchange of arms, to substitute the sword for the pistol. The pistol is blind. Have you succeeded? asked Monte Cristo quickly, with an imperceptible gleam of hope. No, for your skill with the sword is so well known. Ah, who has betrayed me? The skillful swordsman whom you have conquered. And you failed. They positively refused. Morel, said the Count, have you ever seen me fire a pistol? Never. Well, we have time. Look, Monte Cristo took the pistols he held in his hand when Mercedes entered, and, fixing an ace of clubs against the iron plate, with four shots he successively shot off the four sides of the club. At each shot Morel turned pale. He examined the bullets with which Monte Cristo performed this dexterous feat, and saw they were no larger than buckshot. "'It is astonishing,' said he. "'Look, Emmanuel!' Then, turning towards Monte Cristo, "'Count,' said he, "'in the name of all that is dear to you, "'I entreat you not to kill Albert. "'The unhappy youth has a mother.' "'You are right,' said Monte Cristo, "'and I have none.' These words were uttered in a tone which made Morel shudder. You are the offended party, Count. Doubtless. But what does that imply? That you will fire first. I fire first? Oh, I obtained, or rather claimed, that. We had conceded enough for them to yield us that. And at what distance? Twenty paces. A smile of terrible import passed over the Count's lips. Morel, said he, do not forget what you have just seen. The only chance for Albert's safety, then, will arise from your emotion. I suffer from emotion, said Monte Cristo. Or from your generosity, my friend, to so good a marksman as you are, I may say what would appear absurd to another. What is that? Break his arm, wound him, but do not kill him. 
I will tell you, Morel, said the Count, that I do not need entreating to spare the life of Monsieur de Morcerf. He shall be so well spared that he will return quietly with his two friends, while I and you, that will be another thing, I shall be brought home. No, no, cried Maximilian, quite unable to restrain his feelings. As I told you, my dear Morel, Monsieur de Morcerf will kill me. Morel looked at him in utter amazement. But what has happened then since last evening, Count? The same thing that happened to Brutus the night before the Battle of Philippi. I have seen a ghost. And that ghost told me, Morel, that I had lived long enough. Maximilian and Emmanuel looked at each other. Monte Cristo drew out his watch. Let us go, said he. It is five minutes past seven, and the appointment was for eight o'clock. A carriage was in readiness at the door. Monte Cristo stepped into it with his two friends. He had stopped a moment in the passage to listen at a door, and Maximilian and Emmanuel, who had considerately passed forward a few steps, thought they heard him answer by a sigh to a sob from within. As the clock struck eight, they drove up to the place of meeting. "'We are first, said Morel, looking out of the window. "'Excuse me, sir,' said Baptistine, who had followed his master with indescribable terror. "'But I think I see a carriage down there, under the trees.' Monte Cristo sprang lightly from the carriage, and offered his hand to assist Emmanuel and Maximilian. The latter retained the Count's hand between his. "'I like,' said he, "'to feel a hand like this, "'when its owner relies on the goodness of his cause. "'It seems to me,' said Emmanuel, "'that I see two young men down there "'who are evidently waiting.' Monte Cristo drew Morel a step or two behind his brother-in-law. Maximilian, said he, are your affections disengaged? Morel looked at Monte Cristo with astonishment. I do not seek your confidence, my dear friend. I only ask you a simple question. Answer it. That is all I require. I love a young girl, Count. Do you love her much? More than my life. Another hope defeated, said the Count. Then, with a sigh, Poor Haide, murmured he. To tell the truth, Count, if I knew less of you, I should think that you were less brave than you are. Because I sigh when thinking of someone I am leaving? Come, Morel, it is not like a soldier to be so bad a judge of courage. Do I regret life? What is it to me, who have passed twenty years between life and death? Moreover, do not alarm yourself, Morel. This weakness, if it is such, is betrayed to you alone. I know the world is a drawing-room, from which we must retire politely and honestly, that is, with a bow, and our debts of honour paid. That is to the purpose. Have you brought your arms? I? What for? I hope these gentlemen have theirs. I will inquire, said Morel. Do, but make no treaty. You understand me. You need not fear. Morel advanced towards Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud, who, seeing his intention, came to meet him. 
the three young men bowed to each other courteously, if not affably. "'Excuse me, gentlemen,' said Morel, "'but I do not see Monsieur de Morcerf.' "'He sent us word this morning,' replied Chateau Renaud, "'that he would meet us on the ground.' "'Ah,' said Morel. Beauchamp pulled out his watch. "'It is only five minutes past eight, said he to Morel. "'There is not much time lost yet.' "'Oh, I made no illusion of that kind,' replied Morel. "'There is a carriage coming,' said Chateau Renaud. "'It advanced rapidly along one of the avenues "'leading towards the open space where they were assembled. "'You are doubtless provided with pistols, gentlemen. "'Monsieur de Monte Cristo yields his right of using his. "'We had anticipated this kindness on the part of the Count,' said Beauchamp and I have brought some weapons which I bought eight or ten days since, thinking to want them on a similar occasion. They are quite new, and have not yet been used. Will you examine them? Oh, Monsieur Beauchamp, if you assure me that Monsieur de Morcerf does not know these pistols, you may readily believe that your word will be quite sufficient. Gentlemen, said Chateau Renaud. It is not Morcerf coming in that carriage. Faith, it is Franz and Debray. The two young men, he announced, were indeed approaching. What chance brings you here, gentlemen? said Chateau Renaud, shaking hands with each of them. Because, said Debray, Albert sent this morning to request us to come. Beauchamp, and Chateau Renaud exchanged looks of astonishment. "'I think I understand his reason,' said Morel. "'What is it? "'Yesterday afternoon I received a letter from Monsieur de Morcerf, "'begging me to attend the opera. "'And I,' said Debray. "'And I also,' said Franz. "'And we, too,' added Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud. Having wished you all to witness the challenge, he now wishes you to be present at the combat. Exactly so, said the young men. You have probably guessed right. But after all these arrangements, he does not come himself, said Chateau Renaud. Albert is ten minutes after time. There he comes, said Beauchamp, on horseback at full gallop, followed by a servant. "'How imprudent,' said Chateau Renaud, "'to come on horseback, to fight a duel with pistols, "'after all the instructions I had given him. "'And besides,' said Beauchamp, "'with a collar above his cravat, "'an open coat and white waistcoat. "'Why has he not painted a spot upon his heart?' It would have been more simple. Meanwhile, Albert had arrived within ten paces of the group formed by the five young men. He jumped from his horse, threw the bridle on his servant's arms, and joined them. He was pale. His eyes were red and swollen. It was evident that he had not slept. A shade of melancholy gravity overspread his countenance, which was not natural to him. "'I thank you, gentlemen,' said he, "'for having complied with my request. "'I feel extremely grateful for this mark of friendship.' Morel had stepped back as Morcerf approached, and remained at a short distance. "'And to you also, Monsieur Morel, my thanks are due. "'Come, there cannot be too many.' "'Sir,' said Maximilian, "'you are not perhaps aware that I am Monsieur de Monte Cristo's friend.' "'I was not sure, but I thought it might be so. "'So much the better. "'The more honourable men there are here, "'the better I shall be satisfied.' "'Monsieur Morel,' said Chateau Renaud, "'will you apprise the Count of Monte Cristo "'that Monsieur de Morcerf is arrived?' 
and we are at his disposal. Morel was preparing to fulfill his commission. Beauchamp had, meanwhile, drawn the box of pistols from the carriage. "'Stop, gentlemen,' said Albert. "'I have two words to say to the Count of Monte Cristo.' "'In private?' asked Morel. "'No, sir, before all who are here.' Albert's witnesses looked at each other. Franz and Debray exchanged some words in a whisper, and Morel, rejoiced at this unexpected incident, went to fetch the Count, who was walking in a retired path with Emmanuel. "'What does he want with me?' "'I do not know, but he wishes to speak to you.' "'Ah,' said Monte Cristo, "'I trust he is not going to tempt me by some fresh insult. I do not think that such is his intention, said Morel. The Count advanced, accompanied by Maximilian and Emmanuel. His calm and serene look formed a singular contrast to Albert's grief-stricken face, who approached also, followed by the four other young men. When, at three paces distant from each other, Albert and the Count stopped. "'Approach, gentlemen,' said Albert. "'I wish you not to lose one word of what I am about to have the honour of saying to the Count of Monte Cristo, for it must be repeated by you to all who will listen to it, strange as it may appear to you.' "'Proceed, sir,' said the Count. Sir, said Albert, at first with a tremulous voice, but which gradually became firmer, I reproached you with exposing the conduct of M. de Morcerf and Epirus, for, guilty as I knew he was, I thought you had no right to punish him, but I have since learned that you had that right. It is not Fernand Mondego's treachery towards Ali Pasha which induces me so readily to excuse you, but the treachery of the fisherman Fernand towards you, and the almost unheard of miseries which were its consequences. And I say, and proclaim it publicly, that you were justified in revenging yourself on my father, and I, his son, Thank you for not using greater severity. Had a thunderbolt fallen in the midst of the spectators of this unexpected scene, it would not have surprised them more than did Albert's declaration. As for Monte Cristo, his eyes slowly rose towards heaven with an expression of infinite gratitude. He could not understand how Albert's fiery nature, of which he had seen so much among the Roman bandits, had suddenly stooped to this humiliation. He recognized the influence of Mercedes, and saw why her noble heart had not opposed the sacrifice she knew beforehand would be useless. "'Now, sir,' said Albert, if you think my apology sufficient, pray give me your hand. Next to the merit of infallibility which you appear to possess, I rank that of candidly acknowledging a fault. But this confession concerns me only. I acted well as a man, but you have acted better than man. An angel alone could have saved one of us from death and that angel came from heaven, if not to make us friends, which, alas, fatality renders impossible, at least to make us esteem each other. Monte Cristo, with moistened eye, heaving breast, and lips half open, extended to Albert a hand which the latter pressed with the sentiment resembling 
respectful fear. "'Gentlemen,' said he, "'Monsieur de Monte Cristo receives my apology. "'I had acted hastily towards him. "'Hasty actions are generally bad ones. "'Now my fault is repaired. "'I hope the world will not call me cowardly "'for acting as my conscience dictated. "'But if any one should entertain a false opinion of me,' added he, drawing himself up as if he would challenge both friends and enemies, I shall endeavor to correct his mistake. "'What happened during the night?' asked Beauchamp of Chateaurinot. "'We appear to make a very sorry figure here. "'In truth, what Albert has just done is either very despicable very noble replied the baron what can it mean said de bray to franz the count of monte cristo acts dishonorably to m de morcerf and is justified by his son had i ten yaninas in my family i should only consider myself the more bound to fight ten times as for monte cristo his head was bent down his arms were powerless, bowing under the weight of twenty-four years of reminiscences. He thought not of Albert, of Beauchamp, of Chateau Renaud, or of any of that group, but he thought of that courageous woman who had come to plead for her son's life, to whom he had offered his, and who had now saved it by the revelation of a dreadful family secret, capable of destroying for ever in that young man's heart every feeling of filial piety. Providence still, murmured he, now only am I fully convinced of being the emissary of God. End of chapter 90 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Fall 2007 Chapter 91 Mother and Son The Count of Monte Cristo bowed to the five young men with a melancholy and dignified smile and got into his carriage with Maximilian and Emmanuel. Albert, Beauchamp, and Chateau Renaud remained alone. Albert looked at his two friends, not timidly, but in a way that appeared to ask their opinion of what he had just done. "'Indeed, my dear friend,' said Beauchamp first, who had either the most feeling, or the least dissimulation, allow me to congratulate you. This is a very unhoped-for conclusion of a very disagreeable affair. Albert remained silent and rapt in thought. Chateau Renaud contented himself with tapping his boot with his flexible cane. Are we not going said he, after this embarrassing silence. "'When you please,' replied Beauchamp. "'Allow me only to compliment M. de Morcerf, who has given proof to-day of rare chivalric generosity.' "'Oh, yes,' said Chateau Renaud. "'It is magnificent,' continued Beauchamp, "'to be able to exercise so much self-control.' Assuredly, as for me, I should have been incapable of it, said Chateau Renaud, with most significant coolness. Gentlemen, interrupted Albert, I think you did not understand that something very serious had passed between Monsieur de Monte Cristo and myself. Possibly, possibly, said Beauchamp immediately, 
but every simpleton would not be able to understand your heroism, and sooner or later you will find yourself compelled to explain it to them more energetically than would be convenient to your bodily health and the duration of your life. May I give you a friendly counsel? Set out for Naples, the Hague, or St. Petersburg, calm countries, where the point of honor is better understood than among our hot-headed Parisians. Seek quietude and oblivion, so that you may return peaceably to France after a few years. Am I not right, Monsieur de Chateau Renaud? Well, that is quite my opinion, said the gentleman. Nothing induces serious duels, so much as a duel forsworn. Thank you, gentlemen, replied Albert, with a smile of indifference. I shall follow your advice, not because you give it, but because I had before intended to quit France. I thank you equally for the service you have rendered me in being my seconds. It is deeply engraved on my heart, and after what you have just said, I remember that only. Chateau Renaud and Beauchamp looked at each other. The impression was the same on both of them, and the tone in which Morcerf had just expressed his thanks was so determined that the position would have become embarrassing for all if the conversation had continued. "'Good-bye, Albert,' said Beauchamp, suddenly, carelessly extending his hand to the young man. The latter did not appear to arouse from his lethargy. In fact, he did not notice the offered hand. "'Good-bye,' said Chateau Renaud, in his turn, keeping his little cane in his left hand, and saluting with his right. Albert's lips scarcely whispered, Goodbye. But his look was more explicit. It expressed a whole poem of restrained anger, proud disdain, and generous indignation. He preserved his melancholy and motionless position for some time after his two friends had regained their carriage. Then, suddenly unfastening his horse from the little tree to which his servant had tied it, he mounted and galloped off in the direction of Paris. In a quarter of an hour he was entering the house in the Rue du Elder. As he alighted, he thought he saw his father's pale face behind the curtain of the Count's bedroom. Albert turned away his head with a sigh and went to his own apartments. He cast one lingering look on all the luxuries which had rendered life so easy and so happy since his infancy. He looked at the pictures, whose faces seemed to smile, and the landscapes which appeared painted in brighter colors. Then he took away his mother's portrait, with its oaken frame, leaving the gilt frame from which he took it black and empty. Then he arranged all his beautiful Turkish arms, his fine English guns, his Japanese china, his cups mounted in silver, his artistic bronzes by Faucher and Barry, examined the cupboards and placed the key in each, threw into a drawer of his secretary which he left open all the pocket-money he had about him, and with it the thousand fancy jewels from his vases and his jewel-boxes. Then he made an exact inventory of everything, and placed it in the most conspicuous part of the table, after putting aside the books and papers which had collected there. At the beginning of this work his servant, notwithstanding orders to the contrary, came to his room. "'What do you want?' asked he, with a more sorrowful than angry tone. "'Pardon me, sir, 
replied the valet, you had forbidden me to disturb you, but the Count of Montserf has called me. Well, said Albert, I did not like to go to him without first seeing you. Why? Because the Count is doubtless aware that I accompanied you to the meeting this morning. It is probable, said Albert, and since he has sent for me, it is doubtless to question me on what happened there. What must I answer? The truth. Then I shall say the duel did not take place. You will say I apologized to the Count of Monte Cristo. Go. The valet bowed and retired, and Albert returned to his inventory. As he was finishing his work, the sound of horses prancing in the yard, and the wheels of a carriage shaking his window, attracted his attention. He approached the window, and saw his father get into it, and drive away. The door was scarcely closed when Albert bent his steps to his mother's room, and, no one being there to announce him, he advanced to her bedchamber, and distressed by what he saw and guessed, stopped for one moment at the door. As if the same idea had animated these two beings, Mercedes was doing the same in her apartments that he had just done in his. Everything was in order. Laces, dresses, jewels, linen, money, all were arranged in the drawers, and the countess was carefully collecting the keys. Albert saw all these preparations, and understood them, and exclaiming, My mother! he threw his arms around her neck. The artist who could have depicted the expression of these two countenances would certainly have made of them a beautiful picture. All these proofs of an energetic resolution, which Albert did not fear on his own account, alarmed him for his mother. "'What are you doing?' asked he. "'What were you doing?' replied she. "'Oh, my mother!' exclaimed Albert, so overcome he could scarcely speak. "'It is, it is not the same with you and me. You cannot have made the same resolution I have, for I have come to warn you that I bid adieu to your house, and, and to you.' "'I also,' replied Mercedes, "'am going, and I acknowledge I had depended on your accompanying me. Have I deceived myself?' "'Mother,' said Albert, with firmness, "'I cannot make you share the fate I have planned for myself. I must live henceforth without rank and fortune, and to begin this hard apprenticeship I must borrow from a friend the loaf I shall eat until I have earned one. So, my dear mother, I am going at once to ask Franz to lend me the small sum I shall require to supply my present wants. You, my poor child, suffer poverty and hunger? Oh, do not say so. It will break my resolutions. But not mine, mother replied Albert. I am young and strong. I believe I am courageous, and since yesterday I have learned the power of will. Alas, my dear mother, some have suffered so much, and yet live, and have raised a new fortune on the ruin of all the promises of happiness which heaven had made them, on the fragments of all the hope which God had given them, I have seen that, mother. I know that from the gulf in which their enemies have plunged them, they have risen with so much vigor and glory, that in their turn they have ruled their former conquerors, and have punished them. No, 
Mother, from this moment I have done with the past and accept nothing from it, not even a name, because you can understand that your son cannot bear the name of a man who ought to blush for it before another. Albert, my child, said Mercedes, if I had a stronger heart, that is the counsel I would have given you. Your conscience has spoken when my voice became too weak. Listen to its dictates. You had friends, Albert. Break off their acquaintance, but do not despair. You have life before you, my dear Albert, for you are yet scarcely twenty-two years old, and as a pure heart like yours wants a spotless name, take my father's. It was Herrera, I am sure, my dear Albert, Whatever may be your career, you will soon render that name illustrious. Then, my son, return to the world still more brilliant because of your former sorrows. And if I am wrong, still let me cherish these hopes, for I have no future to look forward to. For me, the grave opens when I pass the threshold of this house. I will fulfill all your wishes, my dear mother, said the young man. Yes, I share your hopes. The anger of heaven will not pursue us, since you are pure and I am innocent. But since our resolution is formed, let us act promptly. Monsieur de Morcerf went out about half an hour ago, the opportunity is favorable to avoid an explanation. I am ready, my son, said Mercedes. Albert ran to fetch a carriage. He recollected there was a small furnished house to let in the Rue de Saint-Père, where his mother would find a humble but decent lodging, and thither he intended conducting the countess. As the carriage stopped at the door, and Albert was alighting, a man approached and gave him a letter. Albert recognized the bearer. From the Count, said Bertuccio. Albert took the letter, opened and read it, then looked round for Bertuccio. But he was gone. He returned to Mercedes with tears in his eyes, and heaving breast, and without uttering a word, he gave her the letter. Mercedes read, Albert, while showing you that I have discovered your plans, I hope also to convince you of my delicacy. You are free to leave the Count's house, and you take your mother to your home. But reflect, Albert, you owe her more than your poor noble heart can pay her. Keep the struggle for yourself. Bear all the suffering, but spare her the trial of poverty which must accompany your first efforts. For she deserves not even the shadow of the misfortune which has this day fallen on her, and Providence is not willing that the innocent should suffer for the guilty. I know you are going to leave the Rue du Elder without taking anything with you. Do not seek to know how I discovered it. I know it. That is sufficient. Now, listen, Albert. Twenty-four years ago I returned, proud and joyful to my country. I had a betrothed, Albert, a lovely girl whom I adored, and I was bringing to my betrothed a hundred and fifty louis, painfully amassed by ceaseless toil. This money was for her. I destined it for her, and, knowing the treachery of the sea, I buried our treasure in the little garden of the house my father lived in at Marseilles, on the Allée de Meillan. Your mother, 
Albert, knows that poor house well. A short time since I passed through Marseilles, and went to see the old place, which revived so many painful recollections, and in the evening I took a spade and dug in the corner of the garden, where I had concealed my treasure. The iron box was there. No one had touched it. Under a beautiful fig tree my father had planted the day I was born, which overshadowed the spot. Well, Albert, this money, which was formerly designed to promote the comfort and tranquillity of the woman I adored, may now, through strange and painful circumstances, be devoted to the same purpose. Oh, feel for me, who could offer millions to that poor woman, but who return her only the piece of black bread, forgotten under my poor roof, since the day I was torn from her I loved. You are a generous man, Albert, but perhaps you may be blinded by pride or resentment. If you refuse me, if you ask another for what I have a right to offer you, I will say it is ungenerous of you to refuse the life of your mother at the hands of a man whose father was allowed by your father to die in all the horrors of poverty and despair. Albert stood pale and motionless to hear what his mother would decide after she had finished reading this letter. Mercedes turned her eyes with an ineffable look towards heaven. I accept it, said she. He has a right to pay the dowry, which I shall take with me to some convent. Putting the letter in her bosom, she took her son's arm, and with a firmer step than even she herself expected, she went downstairs. End of chapter 91 Read by Dennis Sayers for LibriVox in Modesto, California, Fall 2006Chapter 92 The Suicide Meanwhile, Monte Cristo had also returned to town with Emmanuel and Maximilian. Their return was cheerful. Emmanuel did not conceal his joy at the peaceful termination of the affair, and was loud in his expressions of delight. Morel, in a corner of the carriage, allowed his brother-in-law's gaiety to expend itself in words, while he felt equal inward joy, which, however, betrayed itself only in his countenance. At the Barriere du Trône they met Bertuccio, who was waiting there, motionless as a sentinel at his post. Monte Cristo put his head out of the window, exchanged a few words with him in a low tone, and the steward disappeared. Count, said Emmanuel, when they were at the end of the Place Royale, put me down at my door, that my wife may not have a single moment of needless anxiety on my account or yours. If it were not ridiculous to make a display of our triumph, I would invite the Count to our house. Besides that, he doubtless has some trembling heart to comfort, so we will take leave of our friend, and let him hasten home. Stop a moment, said Monte Cristo. Do not let me lose both my companions. Return, Emmanuel, to your charming wife, and present my best compliments to her. And do you, Morel, accompany me to the Champ de Lysée? Willingly, said Maximilian, particularly as I have business in that quarter. Shall we wait breakfast for you? asked Emmanuel. No, replied the young man. The door was closed, and the carriage proceeded. See what good fortune I brought you, said Morel, when he was alone with the Count. Have you not thought so? Yes, said Monte Cristo. For that reason I wish to keep you near me. It is miraculous, continued Morel, answering his own thoughts. What, said Monte Cristo, what has just happened? Yes, yeah, said the Count, you are right, it is miraculous. For Albert is brave, resumed Morel. Very brave, said Monte Cristo. I have seen him sleep with a sword suspended over his head. And I know he has fought two duels, said Morel. How can you reconcile that with his conduct this morning? All owing to your influence, replied Monte Cristo, smiling. 
"'It is well for Albert he is not in the army,' said Morel. "'Why?' "'An apology on the ground,' said the young captain, shaking his head. "'Come,' said the Count mildly, "'do not entertain the prejudices of ordinary men, Morel. "'Acknowledge that if Albert is brave, he cannot be a coward. "'He must then have had some reason for acting as he did this morning, "'and confess that his conduct is more heroic than otherwise.' "'Doubtless, doubtless,' said Morel. "'But I shall say, like the Spaniard, "'he has not been so brave to-day as he was yesterday.' "'You will breakfast with me, will you not, Morel?' said the Count, to turn the conversation. "'No, I must leave you at ten o'clock.' "'Your engagement was for breakfast, then?' said the Count. Morel smiled and shook his head. "'Still, you must breakfast somewhere.' "'But if I am not hungry,' said the young man. "'Oh,' said the Count, "'I only know two things which destroy the appetite. "'Grief, and as I am happy to see you very cheerful, it is not that, and love. "'Now, after what you told me this morning of your heart, I may believe—' "'Well, Count,' replied Morel gaily, "'I will not dispute it.' "'But you will not make me your confidant, Maximilian?' said the Count, in a tone which showed how gladly he would have been admitted to the secret. "'I showed you this morning that I had a heart, did I not, Count?' Monte Cristo only answered by extending his hand to the young man. "'Well,' continued the latter, "'since that heart is no longer with you in the Bois de Vincennes, it is elsewhere, and I must go and find it.' "'Go,' said the Count deliberately. "'Go, dear friend.' But promise me, if you meet with any obstacle, to remember that I have some power in this world, that I am happy to use that power in the behalf of those I love, and that I love you, Morel. I will remember it, said the young man, as selfish children recollect their parents when they want their aid. When I need your assistance, and the moment arrives, I will come to you, Count. Well, I rely upon your promise. Good-bye, then. Good-bye, till we meet again. They had arrived in the Champs-Élysées. Monte Cristo opened the carriage door. Morel sprang out on the pavement. Bertuccio was waiting on the steps. Morel disappeared down the Avenue de Marigny, and Monte Cristo hastened to join Bertuccio. Well, asked he. She is going to leave her house, said the steward. And her son? Florentin, his valet, thinks he is going to do the same. Come this way. Monte Cristo took Bertuccio into his study, wrote the letter we have seen, and gave it to the steward. Go, said he quickly, but first... Let Heidi be informed that I have returned. Here I am, said the young girl, who at the sound of the carriage had run downstairs, and whose face was radiant with joy at seeing the Count return safely. Bertuccio left. Every transport of a daughter finding a father, all the delight of a mistress seeing an adored lover, were felt by Heidi during the first moments of this meeting, which she had so eagerly expected. Doubtless, although less evident, Monte Cristo's joy was not less intense. Joy to hearts which have suffered long is like the dew on the ground after a long drought. Both the heart and the ground absorb that beneficent moisture falling on them, and nothing is outwardly apparent. Monte Cristo was beginning to think, what he had not for a long time dared to believe, that there were two Mercedes in the world, and he might yet be happy. His eye, elate with happiness, was reading eagerly the tearful gaze of Heidi, when suddenly the door opened. The Count knit his brow. Monsieur de Morcerf, said Baptistin, as if that name sufficed for his excuse. In fact, the Count's face brightened. Which, asked he, the Viscount or the Count? The Count. Oh, exclaimed Heidi, is it not yet over? I know not if it is finished, my beloved child, said Monte Cristo, taking the young girl's hands, but I do know you have nothing more to fear. But it is the wretched, that man cannot injure me, Heidi, said Monte Cristo. It was his son alone that there was cause to fear. And what I have suffered, said the young girl, you shall never know, my lord. Monte Cristo smiled. By my father's tomb, said he, extending his hand over the head of the young girl, I swear to you, Heidi, that if any misfortune happens, it will not be to me. I believe you, my lord, as implicitly as if God had spoken to me, said the young girl, presenting her forehead to him. Monte Cristo pressed on that pure, beautiful forehead a kiss which made two hearts throb at once, the one violently, the other heavily. Oh, murmured the Count, shall I then be permitted to love again? Ask Monsieur de Morcerf into the drawing-room, said he to Baptistin, while he led the beautiful Greek girl to a private staircase. We must explain this visit, which, although expected by Monte Cristo, is unexpected to our readers. While well, Mercedes, as we have said, was making a similar inventory of her property to Albert's, while she was arranging her jewels, shutting her drawers, collecting her keys, to leave everything in perfect order, 
she did not perceive a pale and sinister face at a glass door which threw light into the passage, from which everything could be both seen and heard. He who was thus looking, without being heard or seen, probably heard and saw all that passed in Madame de Morcerf's apartments. From that glass door the pale-faced man went to the Count's bedroom, and raised with a constricted hand the curtain of a window overlooking the courtyard. He remained there ten minutes, motionless and dumb, listening to the beating of his own heart. For him those ten minutes were very long. It was then Albert, returning from his meeting with the Count, perceived his father watching for his arrival behind a curtain, and turned aside. The Count's eye expanded. He knew Albert had insulted the Count dreadfully, and that in every country in the world such an insult would lead to a deadly duel. Albert returned safely. Then the Count was revenged. An indescribable ray of joy illumined that wretched countenance, like the last ray of the sun before it disappears behind the clouds, which bear the aspect, not of a downy couch, but of a tomb. But as we have said, he waited in vain for his son to come to his apartment with the account of his triumph. He easily understood why his son did not come to see him before he went to avenge his father's honour. But when that was done, why did not his son come and throw himself into his arms? It was then, when the Count could not see Albert, that he sent for his servant, who he knew was authorised not to conceal anything from him. Ten minutes afterwards General Morcerf was seen on the steps in a black coat, with a military collar, black pantaloons, and black gloves. He had apparently given previous orders, for as he reached the bottom step his carriage came from the coach-house ready for him. The valet threw into the carriage his military cloak, in which two swords were wrapped, and, shutting the door, he took his seat by the side of the coachman. The coachman stooped down for his orders. "'To the champs elysees said the general, "'the Count of Monte Cristo's. Hurry!' The horses bounded beneath the whip, and in five minutes they stopped before the Count's door. Monsieur de Morcerf opened the door himself, and as the carriage rolled away, he passed up the walk, rang, and entered the open door with his servant. A moment afterwards, Baptistin announced the Count of Morcerf to Monte Cristo, and the latter, leading Heidi aside, ordered that Morcerf be asked into the drawing room. The general was pacing the room the third time when, in turning, he perceived Monte Cristo at the door. Ah, it is Monsieur de Morcerf, said Monte Cristo quietly. I thought I had not heard all right. "'Yes, it is I,' said the Count, whom a frightful contraction of the lips prevented from articulating freely. "'May I know the cause which procures me the pleasure of seeing Monsieur de Morcerf so early?' "'Had you not a meeting with my son this morning?' asked the General. "'I had,' replied the Count. "'And I know my son had good reasons to wish to fight with you, and to endeavour to kill you.' "'Yes, sir, he had very good ones, but you see that, in spite of them, he has not killed me, and did not even fight.' Yet he considered you the cause of his father's dishonour, the cause of the fearful ruin which has fallen on my house. It is true, sir, said Monte Cristo, with his dreadful calmness, a secondary cause, but not the principal. Doubtless you made then some apology or explanation? I explained nothing, and it is he who apologized to me. But to what do you attribute this conduct? To the conviction, probably, that there was one more guilty than I. And who was that? His father. That may be, said the Count, turning pale, but you know the guilty do not like to find themselves convicted. I know it, and I expected this result. You expected my son would be a coward? cried the Count. Monsieur Albert de Morcerf is no coward, said Monte Cristo. A man who holds a sword in his hand, and sees a mortal enemy within reach of that sword, and does not fight, is a coward. Why is he not here that I may tell him so? Sir, replied Monte Cristo coldly, I did not expect that you had come here to relate to me your little family affairs. Go and tell Monsieur Albert that, and he may know what to answer you. No, 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 said the general, smiling faintly. I did not come for that purpose. You are right. I came to tell you that I also look upon you as my enemy. I came to tell you that I hate you instinctively, that it seems as if I had always known you, and always hated you. And, in short, since the young people of the present day will not fight, it remains for us to do so. Do you think so, sir? Certainly. And when I told you I had foreseen the result, it is the honour of your visit I alluded to. So much the better. Are you prepared? Yes, sir. You know that we shall fight till one of us is dead, said the general, whose teeth were clinched with rage. Until one of us dies, repeated Monte Cristo, moving his head slightly up and down. Let us start, then. We need no witnesses. Very true, said Monte Cristo. It is unnecessary. We know each other so well. 
"'On the contrary,' said the Count, "'we know so little of each other.' "'Indeed,' said Monte Cristo, with the same indomitable coolness, "'let us see. Are you not the soldier Fernand, who deserted on the eve of the Battle of Waterloo? Are you not the Lieutenant Fernand, who served as guide and spy to the French army in Spain? Are you not the Captain Fernand, who betrayed, sold, and murdered his benefactor Ali? And have not all these Fernands, united, made Lieutenant General, the Count of Mercerf, peer of France? Oh, cried the General, as it branded with a hot iron, wretch, to reproach me with my shame when about perhaps to kill me. No, I did not say I was a stranger to you. I know well, demon, that you have penetrated into the darkness of the past, and that you have read, by the light of what torch I know not, every page of my life. But perhaps I may be more honorable in my shame than you under your pompous coverings. No, no, I am aware you know me, but I know you only as an adventurer sewn up in gold and jewelry. You call yourself in Paris the Count of Monte Cristo, in Italy Sinbad the Sailor, in Malta I forget what. But it is your real name I want to know, in the midst of your hundred names, that I may pronounce it when we meet to fight, at the moment when I plunge my sword through your heart. The Count of Monte Cristo turned dreadfully pale. His eye seemed to burn with a devouring fire. He leaped towards a dressing-room near his bedroom, and in less than a moment, tearing off his cravat, his coat, and waistcoat, he put on a sailor's jacket and hat, from beneath which he rolled his long black hair. He returned thus, formidable and implacable, advancing with his arms crossed on his breast, towards the general, who could not understand why he had disappeared, but who, on seeing him again, and feeling his teeth chatter and his legs sink under him, drew back, and only stopped when he found a table to support his clenched hand. Fernand, cried he, of my hundred names, I need only tell you one to overwhelm you. But you guess it now, do you not? Or, rather, you remember it? For notwithstanding all my sorrows and my tortures, I show you to-day a face which the happiness of revenge makes young again, a face you must often have seen in your dreams since your marriage with Mercedes, my betrothed. The general, with his head thrown back, hands extended, gaze fixed, looked silently at this dreadful apparition. Then, seeking the wall to support him, he glided along close to it until he reached the door through which he went out backwards, uttering the single, mournful, lamentable, distressing cry, Edmond Dantes. Then with sighs which were unlike any human sound, he dragged himself to the door, reeled across the courtyard, and falling into the arms of his valet, he said in a voice scarcely intelligible, Home, home. The fresh air and the shame he felt at having exposed himself before his servants partly recalled his senses, but the ride was short, and as he drew near his house, all his wretchedness revived. He stopped at a short distance from the house, and alighted. The door was wide open. A hackney coach was standing in the middle of the yard. A strange sight before so noble a mansion. The Count looked at it with terror, but without daring to inquire its meaning, he rushed towards his apartment. Two persons were coming down the stairs. He had only time to creep into an alcove to avoid them. It was Mercedes leaning on her son's arm and leaving the house. They passed close by the unhappy being, who, concealed behind the damask curtain, almost felt Mercedes' dress brush past him, and his son's warm breath pronouncing these words, "'Courage, mother! Come! This is no longer our home!' The words died away. The steps were lost in the distance. The general drew himself up, clinging to the curtain. He uttered the most dreadful sob which ever escaped from the bosom of a father abandoned at the same time by his wife and son." He soon heard the clatter of the iron step of the hackney coach, then the coachman's voice, and then the rolling of the heavy vehicle shook the windows. He darted to his bedroom to see once more all he had loved in the world. But the hackney coach drove on, and the head of neither Mercedes nor her son appeared at the window to take a last look at the house, or the deserted father and husband. And at the very moment when the wheels of that coach crossed the gateway, a report was heard, and a thick smoke escaped through one of the panes of the window which was broken by the explosion. End of chapter 92